Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Looking forward to learning a heck of a lot about the whole puppy process from my friend Ken Shelton of Huron, South Dakota. But that's not all. But if you are, let's just say you got a puppy recently or you're thinking about it or you're thinking about breeding a dog or uh, something along those lines i can almost guarantee you'll take away from this podcast some knowledge that will be of some value to you someday in your dog owning career so everything from pregnancy and whelping on down the line but that's not all your thoughts on the worst conservation faux pas you know what you've seen out there that you wish you know face palm kind of stuff you're going to share your thoughts with me so looking forward to getting all of those insights the upland nation glossary gets to g plus thank you some folks suggested some ease in there i needed a slot or two filled so appreciate that and a chance to do a solid for one of your mentors uh, that may have uh, you know hunted too long without hearing protection chance to help them out at all it's all coming up on the upland nation podcast oh, brought to you in part by Roughland performance kennels sage and breaker gun care products pointer shotguns dr tim's natural performance dog food mid valley clays and shooting school and audio cardio Dot com. Yeah, it's training season around here and uh, in the high desert already getting too warm. I'm sure that'll stop. You know, we had a record setting heat day and then the next day it snowed on me and Flick when we were out there. But that's uh, that's the, the joy of this time of year, no matter where you live. Some of you are getting uh, vicious, wet storms. Others are already in serious drought conditions we were just declared another extreme drought year and the governor's trying to make it a an official emergency well maybe maybe she will you never know uh but that warm weather has already affected the time of day that we start our training <laughs> oh dark 30 maybe you too um working on one thing in particular with flick besides the steady to wing shot and f uh, fall thing a part and parcel to it i guess would be the the idea that the more birds that get up the more tempting it is to break that uh that point and so <laughs> i've cobbled together a, a milk crate with a lid and a long piece of rope and a hiding place and a covey flush of pigeons which is uh, still um you know it's a work in progress uh, no flick's doing great it's the mechanics of the covey flusher that need a little bit of work maybe you've had the same thing happen you know pigeons generally they're not inclined to fly away unless you give them some inspiration like a mechanical launcher and if you know if you want to jam four or five pigeons into a milk crate all you can do is tip it over and hope they fly away well sometimes you gotta incite them or incent them maybe both to get him in the air and and that in itself is tough on flick he's sitting there quivering the whole time and you, the little tail is just it wants to wag but it doesn't because he knows that's not the right anyway you get the idea so uh good luck on your training if anybody's got a better idea in terms of how to simulate a covey flush with with homing pigeons uh man i am ready for that message me on the facebook pages Speaking of Facebook pages, I asked over there, and boy, did I get some reaction. The picture I put up on the post was uh, a bunch of empty shotgun shells laying on the ground, and I asked, what is the worst hunting or sportsmanship faux pas? Wow, lots of comments, and, and good on you all, because it means you're thinking about this kind of stuff, and that's, uh, that's a good idea no matter what. Wes Birch says he almost always shoots a 28-gauge, but... He seems to collect quite a few 12 and 20 gauge empties when he's out hunting and is surprised every time he empties his vest. I'll never forget, I, I was run, just running a dog around a big 
uh, irrigation pond that we have access to, the public has access to, many, many years ago. And I had a great pair of, man, I wish I had those pants back, um, great pair of uh, military BDUs with really big cargo pockets. By the time I got to the uh, you know, full circle around that pond, the cargo pockets were full of empty shells, full. Uh, um, John Hyde picks up empties whenever he can see them. Uh, don't litter, says Greg Scott Long. Uh, Lance Larson says that's why I use a side-by-side that doesn't have ejectors. Uh, and the faux pas is not picking up the extra empties he finds. Uh, right. Uh, John Wasserman along the same lines. Uh, the problem with auto loaders is everybody wants that third shot. Can't remember where the first two fell. Yeah, good argument. Yeah. Um, uh, the bad ones sure do make the rest of us look bad, says Scott Andrew. George Cummins, I feel your pain. And in fact, it's funny. You and I have probably seen the same thing in the same places some of that state ground or some of those uh, walk-in areas where we get permission to hunt private ground and somebody leaves bird carcasses in the parking lot i found litter in the parking lot and sure enough the next year come back it's not part of the walk-in program yeah i um i know exactly what you mean um and Catherine Castine says it's icon- ironic. The more we litter, the more wildlife suffer. The more wildlife suffers, the less living left to hunt. Uh, yeah, get it. Long run for a longer slide, but that's a good idea. Um, Chet Michael tries hard not to be that guy that gives the rest of us a bad name. And that's, you know, I guess the real argument right there is that. Um, somebody shows up later bird watcher hiker camper whatever um and all of a sudden they see something that clearly is attributable to hunters uh and all of a sudden all hunters are tarred with the same brush i get it and it's a very good point uh all right let's see jack gable says shooting a bird you know is impossible to retrieve once on a release site a guy dropped one in a very wide slough too deep to wade he called me can your dog get that bird yeah you know as the bumper sticker says uh conserve game hunt with a trained dog yes absolutely and uh finally uh j neil phillips says killing birds that were lit on a limb okay remember those days when you were tempted or maybe you did it uh we all did so um anyhow uh think about those sort of things when you can and uh remember that uh uh the reputation of uh, hunters depends on you and me and us we're brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. They're crafted at the highest caliber. Sure enjoyed my visit with the crew there at Pheasant Fest. Learned a lot about them and uh, all the other things. We were right next to one of the uh, stages where presentations were going on, and that was kind of fun, too. On top of free shipping all the time, take a look at their firearms grease now i've talked a lot about CLP, their spray-on. It's kind of a lighter lubricant, but the grease is really important for those high wear locations and i'll give you one perfect example of that that is the little part on a, an over and under or side by side that swivels in and out that is metal on metal and it is basically uh, grinding apart the other i don't even know what you call that i guess i ought to learn that stuff the other more important one for most of us most of the time is choke tubes put some of the uh, sage and breaker uh, uh, firearm grease on your choke tube threads and they will keep your tubes from basically welding themselves to your gun's bore so learn more about all of that watch the videos at sageandbreaker.com and speaking of shotguns i think i've mentioned this but there is so much interest in youth guns these days pointer shotguns has several models available at legacy sports Dot com. Take a look at the 22 catalog. It's available online. Of course, if you're anywhere that they have a dealer, you can pick up a hard copy of that as well. 
they got a full line of shotguns, but on the youth side, you know, we all understand how important it is to uh, shorten the stock so the young shooter gets a good sight picture, gets his face up against the stock in the right place, that sort of thing. The key to good shooting with a shorter stock, though, is balancing it with a shorter barrel. Think about that. Think about balance. Think about how that affects swing. Think that, Think about how that affects accuracy and success. And in a young shooter, we want success. In fact, take a look at some of the stuff I've done in recent weeks in the, um, the Upland Nation Insights newsletter on young shooters and some of the things that might make some sense to you if you're introducing one. It's all available at LegacySports.com. Well, I learned so much at Pheasant Fest uh, uh, about a whole bunch of things and got to meet some friends, uh, uh, you know, distant friends who then became closer friends and then friends that I haven't seen for a while, including this guy, Kent Shelton. He's from here on South Dakota. Uh, Kent and I, well, you've seen Kent on the show. You've seen his dogs on the show. Uh, you have um, heard about him, learned about him. You've seen his lovely wife, Lori, on the show uh, that we made in here on a couple years back. Uh, but we got to talking about puppies because uh, he was in a very interesting position at the time. So I'll let him explain it. Ken Shelton, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Well, how are you today? I'm uh, looking forward to a good training afternoon. It's a little warm, but we're going to still work on um, some of the things that my wire hair need work on. How about yourself? How's your How'd your past season go? You know, actually, we had a great season here in South Dakota. It was, uh, I was telling people at Pheasant Fest, it's one of the first years that I've gone through that uh, I would say we didn't have more than four days we didn't limit for the day, which with groups that we had, which is awesome for us here in South Dakota. And and you're taking these, you're, you're, you're a guide, you're a breeder, um, you're just an avid bird hunter, period. And, and it's good to hear that you had such uh, good success because all we hear is the bad news about South Dakota. Right. And, and there's no doubt our bird numbers have been down the last few years. Um, can't deny that. But the pockets, and that's what I tell people, if you can find the habitat, you'll find the birds. And so we always try to hunt areas that we know has good habitat, uh, food in the area, maybe some water. And uh, if you've got good habitat, you're going to have birds in South Dakota. You used a word that I use in maybe a different way. I'm going to ask you to explain it in a minute. But, uh, you know, to a great degree, there are hot spots and not hot spots. I mean, there are, like you said, pockets. You use that term. Uh in in the Huron area, Beetle County, that area with all that public access and with uh, you know a lot of private ground open to hunting as well, what what would define a good spot for you? What kinds of habitat are in that? So I look for you know good native grasses, whether it uh, be switchgrass, blue stem, and I don't necessarily hunt that, but I look for it to be in the area of where I'm going to hunt. Yeah, cattails, uh, maybe some trees in the area. People don't realize how much the pheasants like to be in the trees because it gives them good uh, cover away from the predators. It also gives them some shelter against any weather we're having. Yeah, of course, that's one of the arguments for a great shelter belt strategy. Um, And I'll never forget, it was just a little bit down the road from you folks many years ago. We did a show uh where the shelter belt must have been a hundred years old because they were big trees and it was a wet year and so we were slogging through ankle deep water in this shelter belt um kind of reminded me of a bayou in in louisiana but the birds were all you know in the first level of branches in those trees Oh, yeah. The, you know, originally pheasants are tree birds. And so when it's uh, when there's a lot of dew or wetness on the ground, it, you, it's not unusual in South Dakota to drive by a, a shelter belt, a tree strip, and see birds in the lower level of the trees. Absolutely. You know, uh, that, is a, that is a phenomenon I've never seen anywhere else, but I've never seen a shelter belt that uh, mature before. So it, it kind of shocked me. I mean... 
Yeah, it didn't stop us from shooting, but we didn't shoot on the limb. No, no, we did not do that. And thanks no. to thanks to the comments on our Facebook page about uh, sportsmanship faux pas, um, right? You know, that's one of them, at least. Uh, you know, uh, I want to start because I I reminded everybody earlier in the podcast we're going to talk about puppies and breeding and uh, the the adventure that you have just gone through when we were at Pheasant Fest together. One of your uh, girls, your Labrador girls, was sh- making noises and doing things that led you to believe she was about ready to whelp while you were away. And that was kind of weird. Uh, so why don't, why don't you just tell me the whole story there? I, I know it came out okay. Pardon the pun. Yep. But uh, tell, tell me about your recent whelping adventures. Well, Ticket, who is one of my... Well, I've, I've got four dogs right now. Ticket's one of my females. She's a great dog. Um, she, we had bred her about eight and a half weeks before we came, or eight weeks before we came to Pheasant Fest. The, the gestation period on dogs is nine weeks, 63 days. And uh, she had traditionally gone a day or two early as far as whelping her puppies. And so when I looked on my cameras, because I have cameras to watch my dogs and that kind of thing, um, she was really um, not comfortable. She was getting up, moving a lot, sitting down, licking herself, getting up, moving her a lot. And she could just tell she was uncomfortable. And I just happened to have a friend that's a vet here in town and had her come out and check her and everything was good. But uh, since then, uh, this past Thursday, so just over a week ago, she had seven puppies. So, Woo-hoo. yeah, knew they were coming, just didn't know when. And she was right on the day she was supposed to, the 63rd day on Thursday. But you always worry because they can have them. Well, they can technically have them any time, but they're really viable uh, about that 56th, 57th, 58th day uh, to 65 days it can. So it's not from the date of breeding necessarily. It's the date of ovulation. And that ovulation could take place two or two days before or two days after breeding. So I love it. Well, congratulations. I I know every mom and and kids are doing well, and that's wonderful. The other wonderful thing is, I'm moving to Huron, South Dakota, where veterinarians will make house calls. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to have friends in places, and it's not what you know; it's who you know. Oh, isn't that the truth? And I, I'm knocking wood as I say that. I've got to. Well, heck, we that's a rabbit hole we'll go down some other time. You know, you the whole idea though of breeding and and then through the process process and and you're in the midst of it still i i i can't imagine uh but let's start way back uh what what guides your breeding philosophy well here's the way i look at it so when i first uh you know i'd always had dogs my family did when i was growing up and we had labs and we had a springer and uh you know my dad wasn't into breeding them just hunting dogs you know um so when i moved back to south dakota uh, after finishing college, um, hunted with a few guys that had some pretty decent dogs. So I wanted to have a dog of my own. So I looked for a good breeder that had all the health clearances for labs because there's a number of issues with every breed has a number of issues. So I looked for a breeder that uh, had good health clearances. I found a dog I loved. Uh, this was in 1998, I believe. And uh, then uh, in 2000, got my second dog. And then 2002, got my third dog. And at that point, my wife says, you better figure out some way to pay for these dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, you know, I and I ran hunt tests because I wanted to do something in the off season, if you will, uh, other than hunting. So I started running AKC hunt tests with my dogs and, and uh, was fairly successful at that. Had junior titles, senior titles. Um, and it was doing really well. And the third dog I got, uh, her name was Sadie. She was out of a um, yellow dog that was a uh, one of the top yellow dogs in the country. And so I, I and and I was always looking for breedings that had um, one that hunted the dogs actually hunted, but two had good health clearances. And so, uh, and you want a dog that's good looking also. So obviously I was looking at the looks too, but um, just decided to get a a female at that point in time because my two first dogs were males and then uh, put a junior title, then a senior title on her. And she was a heck of a dog. She was out of Rebel with a Cause, which was 
back then the the top yellow dog in the country and uh, as far as field trials and so then i started looking into possibly breeding and the 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 philosophy I go by for breeding, I don't breed unless I think I can better the breed, if you will. And so I look for matches in breedings that uh, I think will produce really good puppies, very healthy puppies, genetically healthy, and uh, ones that I would want myself and I end up keeping. In fact, all of my last, I can't remember how many dogs are out of breedings that I've had. Wow. And so I look for the dogs that I would want for hunting purposes um, and just family dogs, good family dogs. Well, you've hit on a lot of things that are really important, that, and that is the number one reason to breed a dog, no doubt about it. Um, the other thing that I, I thought was important about what you just said was was all those health clearances. Uh, when, you're, when you're selling a puppy um, or when you're looking at a new dog to bring into your breeding program, uh, what are the, on a Labrador at least, what are the, what are the parts of the anatomy that you think are really important to, enough to, to maybe put on paperwork of some sort? Sure. So there's a there's a place called the OFFA, which is Orthopedic Foundation for Animals. Um, so I have all my dogs uh, hip and elbow uh, x-rayed and sent in for certification. Um, you can do that prior to the two years of age, but it's just called a prelim at that point. Mm-hmm. Once they hit two years of age, you can do it, uh, which will give you the you know, the propensity, if you will, for good hips, good elbows on the dog. The other thing I do is uh, do the eye test by a veterinary ophthalmologist that comes in and certifies that their eyes are clear. They don't have any folds or defects in the eyes because those three things, elbow, hips, and eyes physically are the things you have to look at for Labrador retrievers. Uh, Everybody knows Labrador retriever has been the number one bred dog for years in the country as far as numbers and so you know people aren't uh, don't watch that stuff and could end up with dogs you know that don't have good eyes don't have good hips don't have good elbows I mean I've I've been around dogs that are six years old and look like they're 16 because their hips are bad they don't you know they can't move around well and uh, when I used to give my seminars, uh, training seminars at Sportsman's Warehouse in Sioux Falls and that kind of thing, I said, you know, anybody can breed a dog, but you want to look for a, a healthy litter. So your first thing should be the genetics, the health, the certifications of the dog first is what you look for and find the litter, then decide what color, what sex you want, that kind of thing. But find ones that are healthy and so I had a number of people say well I got this dog from Joe Farmer down the road who bred it to another dog because they were a good hunt dog and I said yeah you can end up with a a great dog that way but your percentages of of health issues that kind of thing goes up tremendously if they haven't been tested and there's not a history of testing oh amen to that uh you're listening to the upland nation podcast that's kent shelton from here on south dakota labrador breeder hunter friend and uh, colleague in the bird dog world and i am scott linden the host of this uh, little party uh you know we had a what we were beaten the brush one day in south dakota we got to talking about those uh yellow labrador dogs and uh, and i was commenting maybe on how how dark and uh, to the, these colorblind eyes almost red looking some of these so-called yellow labs are you had an interesting comment about that do you remember anything uh, i doubt you remember that conversation but maybe maybe you can recall kind of the the theory you had for yellow labs and where they came from absolutely and so the research that i've done and i you know my wife says you never read anything <laughs> and, but you're always but you're always picking up a book about dogs and history of dogs and training dogs and so on and so forth so she she picks on me a lot and i tell her well in my job that i do i read every day all day so i'm not really interested in coming home and reading a big <laughs> fictional novel but i like to I like to pick up and read about things, the history of dogs. So, you know, knowing that there's only three colors of true Labrador retrievers, and that being black as the main, yellow, and chocolate, there's no such thing as a purely bred anything other color. Now, blacks are obviously black. Um, 
chocolates are obviously chocolate, and that can range from a lighter colored chocolate to a darker colored chocolate. But yellows are a kind of a little bit of a phenomenon, if you will. They can range from almost white to almost what people call fox red. Yeah. And and so the, the what I read about, um, and this is just what I've seen, is that originally the yellow Labrador Retreater was the dark, dark, dark yellow or fox red color. And that was over in Europe, in the UK, uh, and they were the predominant color. In fact, they used to do away with any lighter colored yellows that were born because that wasn't supposed to be the purely yellow lab. Well, at one time, at some point in time, a king of England decided they really liked the lighter colored uh, Labradors and kept one. So at some point in time, the, the original darker yellow then moved to where, and we know how that goes, you know, if somebody of importance decides they like something, then people tend to follow suit. Then people started liking the lighter colored yellows. So in the yellow Labrador Retrievers, they can vary from absolutely almost pure white to uh, almost golden retriever red color. And yeah. so they vary. All the other colors, uh, all the other, the black and the chocolate remain the same if they're purely, um, you know, purebred uh, Labrador retrievers without the dilute gene, which is a new gene that has kind of come, I, I say new, it's been around for years, but it uh, seems to be pretty prominent with people who want uh, more of a different lab and they're coming out with this dilute gene that then uh, kind of turns up as kind of a silverish color or whatever and there's all kinds of theories about that but you mm -hmm. can actually test for that dilute gene through genetic testing uh, such places such as paw print genetics and I have all my dogs genetically tested also for a number of different things and there's some other diseases you and I should talk about at some point in time here but that dilute gene, uh, I just don't want in my breeding program because it's not a true Labrador gene, if you will. Okay, since you opened the floodgates, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> there is a. I mean, you want to start an argument on on a Facebook dog page? Just mention silver Labrador retrievers. Oh my goodness, yeah. Um, and yep. it, and I'm not asking you to take sides, but what what are the prevailing theories there? You mentioned the dilute gene, and maybe that is it. But but what else is in that whole discussion? Well, people, the the theory, if you will, of uh, the Labrador world is that at some point somebody introduced a Weimaraner uh, that gives it the grayish color into and bred, but then said it said they bred it to another lab, and that um, somehow that dilute gene, if you will, that Weimaraner colored gray got into the gene pool of the Labrador Retrievers. And what's really ironic about that, they don't call them when AKC registers or UKC registers, they don't call them silver. Yeah. They don't call them black because they're not black. They don't call them yellow, obviously. They actually call them chocolate. Okay. And when they're registered, they're registered on their registration will say chocolate, even though they're far from being a chocolate lab. I don't think I'd put that flavor of chocolate in my mouth. <laughs> no, That's for right? sure. Yeah, right. But, but there you go. Hey, I, I, I just need a South Dakota fix for a minute. Let's go back to hunting season and, uh, and, and just to recount maybe one or two of your highlights this past season, just so I can get psyched. I, yeah, I warned you at Pheasant Fest, I'm coming out this year. So, <laughs> right. Uh, and by the way, everybody else is invited there too. And we'll get to that later on in the next couple of weeks. But uh, what was the highlight of your hunting season, Kent? You know, you know, almost every year, the highlight of my hunting season is two things. One, I have college buddies um, that I went to school with or that I met through going to school at the University of Montana and Missoula. And uh, a number of guys, I got to be friends with a number of guys out of Great Falls, Montana. They're now uh, everywhere from the state of Washington to the state of Oklahoma, uh, Wyoming, Florida. They're all over the place. And every year uh, I have anywhere from six to ten of them that come out here, stay at Lori in my house, and uh, we just crash all over the place. And 
We have a really good time. We hunt hard. We play hard when they're here, although at our age, we don't play near as hard as we used to. Um, <laughs> and uh, my wife makes us good meals. We go out to eat. And we just enjoy it. And, and every year, that's one of the two biggest highlights of my of my year is having them here. And to be honest, that's my really true judge of how the pheasant population is because we hunt all private land, uh, all wild birds. Um, and this year we, we um, limited out every day except for one. We had a tough day one, one day and we hunted all day long. And I think we were only about three birds short of our limit. But to me, that's a true judge of the pheasant population do, hunting four days in a row with basically out-of-state hunters, but they're all good hunters and solids. A couple of them have dogs to hunt. And uh, that's a true indication of the pheasant season. And truthfully, even though I know that the, the pheasant population as a whole in South Dakota is down from what it was in the 90s and early 2000s, but it's still good. Um, yeah. I mean, you still will still walk into a field where we'll flush a fe- th- 100 pheasants out of one field. I mean, it just happens. You know, I tell everybody, and it's almost a cliche now, but well, I guess it is. I keep telling people the same thing. A bad season in South Dakota is better than a good season everywhere else put together. Right. I mean, it just, I know they say we have anywhere from 5 million to 10 million birds. Uh, that to me that's not a true indication it's actually being out there putting the feet on the ground and uh seeing what there is out there i'll never forget a uh, we, uh yeah, it, yeah there were 30 or 40 of us we all fished for science on a trout unlimited project and in two days did basically did the same thing you did gathered so much data from so wide an area that it was pretty good science and uh, and you guys just did the same thing and it, it seems to be true how do you guys hunt with a group like that do you split up or do you all gang together and put some blockers and drivers what's your strategy now for south dakota and and you've been here scott you know how spooky the birds get and my college buddies come the weekend before thanksgiving so these birds have all been probably hunted you know mm-hmm. one to five yeah. times yeah. so they're getting spooky and you walk up to a field of wild pheasants and you get out of your truck and you start slamming doors and yelling at your dog and talking to your buddy and laughing, they're gone. I mean, they need to get up and move. Um, so the strategy that we always use that I grew up with that I've always used is we have walkers and we have blockers. And uh, when you have six to 10 guys, I think is a pretty good number. I mean, I don't mind hunting one or two guys because you can be really quiet and sneak up on pe- on birds yeah. but uh you know that six to ten is a good number we always have you know two to six walkers and two to four blockers and we pick a piece of field you can't hunt a whole quarter section you've got to you've got to pick a piece that looks the best to start with and kind of cut it down to, and make it a small piece of ground and the smaller the better for that type of group and you might have a couple wingers up ahead on the sides two or three or four walkers with dogs in the middle walking and then two or three blockers on the end you just you just said something that i've uh, i've done for decades while fly fishing uh, and that is just break a big piece of water into a smaller bunch of pieces and then go about a strategy for each of those and and you're absolutely right this stealth thing has really last couple of years has been driven home to me and i don't care what we're hunting whether it's ringnecks or chuckers or wild hungarian partridge it doesn't matter you, you know we can all be a little bit more strategic about that stuff and even in a very small group here's something i learned making a show actually in northeast oregon I, those those dang birds were running down those uh milo rows the whole time we could never right. we, we would get a great point from a, a, one of the guides short hairs or something and then we'd all walk up on that point and the birds were already 80 yards down that row we could see right. them you know so i started doing a, a variation on this and it, you know this is one of those forehead slapping things i wish i'd thought of 30 years ago when we had a dog hit a point uh one or two of us would stay and flank that dog but then I would go out front safely, of course, everybody knew where I was, and I would block the next 30 yards. Oh, absolutely. And so it would push the birds, you know, 
into the air, but generally it would push them away from me and uh, away from the other two gunners in a safe direction. In this case, yeah. it was usually toward the railroad tracks, but that's another story. <laughs> you, you saw that on Wing Shooting USA. But anyway, uh, those kind of just thinking about those sort of things before you slam the truck door or start yelling at your dog, those things really do matter, don't they? Oh, absolutely. And and especially, you know, early in the season, those younger birds, they just kind of don't know what's going on. So a lot of times they'll just kind of, they hear noises and they'll just kind of hunker down and mm-hmm. and think they're hidden. And it's surprising how a beautiful bird like a pheasant can hide and you can be standing right by one and not see it. But as you get later in that season, even those young birds, let alone the birds that are two or three years old, they figure out, and it's it it, it it amazes me every year that you have a, a bird, an animal, that has a brain about the size of a 50-cent piece. And they can out <laughs> figure you out in 20 seconds and know exactly where the gaps are in the groups and know where to run and know where to hide, and they can get around you. So it amazes me. So that's why we use the surround if you will yeah yeah uh, being safe with walkers wingers and blockers to do exactly what you're kind of doing and that is because those birds will run right to the end and then they'll see those blockers or hear those blockers and it's amazing how as you get towards the end the birds will start coming back over the they'll get up and come back over the walkers or try to run by you and that's why good dogs are so important so those birds can't run back by you i had that happen in uh montana last year on sharp-tailed grouse of all things we're in a a sagebrush field basically and we walked much like a pheasant hunt we walked it across and i thought we'd covered it like a vacuum cleaner Mm -hmm. yeah but our our good friend al gadori who was there uh, as a civilian that day on on public walking ground he said you know i just don't know we got like we were working one of his dogs i'm pretty sure and just one dog and three hunters it was a pretty big patch so he said let's let's double back and just hit it again and sure enough we got two birds out of there so they they do hunker a lot and i saw this on a video um at pheasant fest dr kelly reyna by the way kelly thanks for listening and thanks for your inspirational story here's a guy who's teaching they're experimenting uh teaching bob white quail to act pen raised bob white quail to act more like wild birds so he shows me two videos the first one is a simulated raptor flying over a a covey of bob whites and they all scatter to the four points of the compass fly away he says all right now tell me were those wild birds and were they acting like wild birds or were those pen raised birds and and i said well that's every wild bird i i've met ever does that he said no no they don't you don't know you're going past them because wild birds will not Uh fly for a a, a raptor they'll hunker down and in fact they'll try and point their butt end toward where that raptor's coming from it's kind of a little camouflage thing i think so it was a lesson in number one wild bird behavior and then also like i said very gratified to hear kelly's story someday i'll tell it on the air but in the meanwhile thanks kelly thanks kent for driving that point home again no matter what kind of bird it is and thank you all for listening everybody hey stick around we got a lot more to come on the uh upland nation podcast kent you get a moment or two so just relax i'm going to tell you about a couple other things but i'm also going to remind you we have more on puppies more on breeding and birthing and all of that plus our upland glossary gets to the letter f f no g We're already to G, plus a couple suggestions on E, and uh, a lot more on hunting, of course, my favorite subject, so stick around. The Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by audiocardio.com. Just like it sounds, audio, cardio, funny name, but no, it's a workout for your ears. That's why Brian and Chris and everybody else came up with the name. It's a hearing wellness app yeah just subscribe you can try it on a 14 day free trial it's like physical therapy for your ears uh you can go about your business just keep your earbuds in every day you're strengthening your hearing at audiocardio.com i know i mentioned it once i'll tell you again 14 day free trial and then it can be as low as eight 
bucks and 33 cents a month. Watch the two minute video and learn all about how this works. Yes, you can improve your hearing at audiocardio.com. And I spent significant time and uh, made a lot of new friends at the Roughland Kennels booth at Pheasant Fest. Rough, R-U-F-F, landkennels.com is where you learn all about their new colors, all the new accessories thanks to the new gear they've installed in T, South Dakota. R-U-F-F, Land Kennels, roughlandkennels.com variety of sizes you know they are the pioneers in roto molded dog crates they've got something for everybody whether it's water storage water dispensing gear organizing all of those new gen 2 kennels they stack they couple with previous versions if you have some of those and i just installed not that it took much one of their great fans so we're all ready for the warm season here flick's got his own air conditioning system in his rough land kennel and maybe that's something for you as well and with that in mind i welcome back to the upland nation podcast kent shelton from here on south dakota breeder hunter guide all around good guy <laughs> no and seriously you are and i appreciate it and i've learned so much just in our brief conversation over there and where were we omaha <laughs> uh, right let's go back to the puppy thing because you, you you were just explaining even fundamental stuff like counting the number of puppies in a pregnant girl uh, there's there's x-rays there's ultrasounds and there's arguments for both but you know, tell us about that kind of the pre-whelping process and what you have to do as a breeder during that process sure so um most people don't know a dog will come into heat uh every six months approximately and it can be five to eight months give or take uh once they hit about a year year and a half old um they then are when they're in heat if you will uh the they can be, they can ovulate somewhere in the seven to twenty day range, but generally it's right around that nine to fourteen day range. Uh, best breeding takes place during ovulation, and you can test their progesterone levels to see where they're at when you should uh, try a breeding. I like to get at least two good ties, maybe three, um, somewhere in that nine to fourteen day range, and I always progesterone test. Uh, generally a dog once they go over the five range on the progesterone test is when they're ready and they're ovulating and then uh, nine weeks but I have all of my dogs um, ultrasounded at 30 days uh, x-raying them doesn't do you a lot of good until those bones have calcified and that kind of thing so you wouldn't know until uh, you know generally in that 50 day range and they're going to have their puppies at 63 so I like to have kind of an idea at 30 days and 30 days seems to be the key point for ultrasounding uh, a dog and they can't they, they aren't specific i mean they can give you a range of how many puppies but uh ultrasound you gotta you gotta remember you're dealing with a, a half dollar sized embryo if that wow um at at 30 days so they're you know just a little move of the uh ultrasound uh, i'll call it a gun if you will uh could you could see the same puppy twice you could see a different puppy and not know you're looking so it doesn't take much and uh, the dogs have uh, two fallopian tubes if you will uh, that the puppies come down one on either side of the abdomen and so they they try to check and see they call them horns actually but you check and see how many puppies so it, my my the vet i use for ultrasound has been pretty accurate um, within a puppy or two usually of how many they think they're going to be and you know so most time they'll just tell you yes they're pregnant i always have my vet <laughs> say hey give me a range you know five to seven puppies eight to ten what you know what might there be and they're pretty yeah. good about that and 
um, on ultrasound, being able to tell about how many puppies there might be. And I could see a value to that, especially if you're a breeder and, you, and you've got people on a waiting list, for example, and, you, and there's nine people on the list and you think there's going to be six puppies. All of a sudden, you got to manage expectations a little bit. Uh, right. So that makes a lot of sense. Let's go. Let's go way back. Um, does does the male dog always come to the female dog? How what's the protocol in breeding a dog in that in that regard? Right. So the the uh, I guess the way most people do it is you take the female to the male. Uh huh. Um, so when I've uh, bred my dogs, I've gone as far away as Missouri. Uh, because I found a dog that I really like to, to breed with. Uh, I've been able to find a couple of good dogs with all the correct certifications and health certifications and that kind of thing locally. When I would say locally, within the state of South Dakota, Minnesota, Nebraska, somewhere closer. But generally, the female goes to the male and will stay there for a period of time to get more than one breeding. In other sure. words, I like to get uh, two or three ties, and you 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 have those ties or you try those breedings and you try to make them about two days apart. The, the sperm wolves are viable within the female for about 48 hours. So if you miss the date of ovulation by a couple of days and you do a second breeding two days later, now you've just expanded your time frame to four days instead of just two. And if you do a third, now you've expanded to six or eight days instead of just mm-hmm. two or four days. Mm-hmm. So, you're more likely. And of course the female determines how many puppies there will be. You're going to have plenty of sperm. That's not an issue. So Uh it's how many ever eggs the female puts off. And that's, that's viable eggs because they could have more eggs, but some aren't viable. And that's, that'll determine how many puppies you might have. And, um, you know, we all hear, Oh, I I stud my dog out for pick of the litter, but is that typically how it works or do people really want something else besides another dang puppy right well you know some people that have uh the good stud dogs that have have all the health testing and genetic testing and have been taken to hunt test or field trials and that kind of thing to prove that they are in fact a dog that is a good dog well trainable easy to train that kind of thing um i would say nine times out of ten no they're they're getting a breeding fee yeah. Uh, I have had a couple say, you know, we love your female. We know her breeding. We love our male. We like the combination. I have had a couple that said, we'll take pick of the litter. And that's really the male or stud dog's choice to be worked out with the female owner. In other words, to come to an agreement ahead of sure. time. Sure, yeah. And then uh, then it, there comes the day, and we'll talk about which day that is, but you've got uh, a line of puppy buyers and uh, a pile of puppies um who picks who assigns puppies to to buyers and uh how does that all work so the way i do it and it's not all um, but the way i do it is based upon the deposit given and uh, you say you're interested in a puppy and you want a puppy and so you're first in line and I, I generally like to, depending on what colors of puppies I'm going to have, uh, you know, are, are you interested in a black or a yellow or, and I may be an all black litter because litter, because I bred two blacks and one of them's not any other factor, but black or, mm-hmm. you know, if you breed a yellow to a yellow, they're all going to be yellow because that's all the genes a yellow can put off is a yellow oh, gene. Okay. So. Um, so then first is color. And for instance, this last litter I had is going to be all black because, uh, the male was not yellow factored and the female was, but the male wasn't. So they were going to be a black litter. And, uh, so then I, do you want a male or are you more interested in male or female? And some people are dead set. I want a female only, or I want a male only. Right. Some are like, I'd like a female, but I'd take a male because you just don't know what you're going to have. So then they get on a list and I had 11 on this list for ticket. And I usually have my list. Like I already have nine on the list for ticket for next year when I wow. have a litter of puppies. But so then when they're born, I start advising my, you know, puppy owners that, uh, here's what I've got. And I kind of go down the line and I might miss one or two and then make it up. You know, I have had one male, one female so far, and then I might skip a couple cause we're busy having puppies. And I try to let the female do as much as she can, as long as there's no issues. But once in a while you got to help, you got to, 
uh, break open the membrane or cut the umbilical cord or something. Once in a while, you got to help a little bit. And then I always clean them up and weigh them and all that good stuff and then get them on so they're getting milk right away. The colostrum's the best thing for them in that first 48 hours or so. But then uh, I'll advise all the puppy owners, here's what I had. I ended up having four males and three females. So you three females, which were the first three female picks, you're in for sure. Now, if there was a female pick, a fourth female, for instance, pick before the male pick, they still get to decide whether they want to, because they were, sure. they're fourth on the list. So they yeah. get to decide, what well, do I want to take a male or do I want to wait for a female for the next litter? And then I end up, you know, figuring out and we get it all worked out and I find out who of the seven or so um, are on the list. And then the other ones can either get their deposit back or they can go on to the next uh, list for a puppies and in this case the four that didn't get puppies this last time they all just said well wait we know we want out of this female we want we like her we've hunted with her we've seen her whatever the case may be and so I actually had four of them go to the next year's list and that's why I have nine on the list for next year already wow that's uh it's nice to be wanted I guess right exactly <laughs> so um so you got all these puppies and let's just say you had 11 puppies mm -hmm. how does a mother cope with that many how does she keep them fed well that's a good question so, so every dog is different and they produce a certain amount of milk and that kind of thing ticket for instance which is the female that um uh had this litter of puppies in fact she's out of what was one of my best uh, female dogs, Izzy, who was out of five-star general patent, which was a national field trial champion. She produces so much milk, she looks like a milk cow. I'm, wow. I am absolutely, if I took a picture and sent it to you, you, you can't even imagine how much milk. So the litter she's had in the past, this was her smallest litter of seven. She's had 10, 11, and 12 before. And she has enough milk, she could not only feed the 12, but she could probably take on a second litter at the same time. Oh, she my. produces that much milk. But then she eats a tremendous amount. I usually yeah. feed my dogs yeah. about a, a cup and three quarters to two cups morning and night, twice a day. So four cups a day. And when she had 12 last year, um, I was feeding her almost 12 cups of food a day. And she went, instead of drinking one to two quarts of water a day, she was drinking up to nine quarts of water a day. Oh, my God. That's just that's mind-boggling volumes oh, yeah. wow but i understand when you have a dog of yeah. 60 pounds yeah, yeah eating that much and drinking that much so incredible and and the puppies all figure out where to go to get fed and then there's you know it's, a... it's amazing to me i'll see these puppies being born and like i said i do let her lick them up and and clean them the best she can but then i'll take them and take a clean towel and scrub them up real good and get them breathing really good and get them whining a little bit and mm -hmm. and get them moving around then i weigh them um because i want to know what they weigh to make sure you know i weigh them every day for about the first two weeks to make sure they're all gaining weight they might lose a half an ounce or an ounce the first day or two but then they start picking up because mom's milk hasn't come all the way in and it's mostly sure. just the colostrum it's not the full milk but then um as soon as i get them cleaned up and so i put them right back on mom and i actually have help them find the right place to go to nurse right um and make sure and she wants to lick them lock so she'll knock them off and mm -hmm. you you have to put them back on but it's amazing how within that first 15 minutes if they get knocked off they're searching out where the food is coming from and they have no problem finding it it, it just blows me away that they can find where they need to go i mean it's just that inherent you know drive to get food and they figure it out they know where to go Speaking of going, uh, what do you think is the right day to send those puppies home with their new owners? Well, I'm sure you're, you've heard of the 49th day as being the key day mm. for a, a puppy to go home. Now, for instance, state of Minnesota uh, doesn't allow their puppies to go home until they're eight weeks old, which puts them at, what, the 57th, 56th day, somewhere in that ballpark. Um state of south dakota doesn't have that that law um if you read any of um, richard walter's books he says 49th day got to pick them up on the 49th mm -hmm. i don't think it's i'm personally not a person that that dwells on the 49th day i think a puppy needs to be with its litter mates its mom whatever until it's seven weeks old i i 
I think that's necessary for them to learn how to act like a dog and know what the yeses and noes are as far as mom teaching them. And I keep my puppies on my female till they're six weeks old. Uh, and then they're just with the rest of the litter and they learn how to cope with other dogs and they learn how to act with other dogs and when rough is too rough and when you know sleep time is sleep time and that kind of thing so I think it's important but then somewhere between that seventh and ninth week is when they really should be going home got it and uh, you hit on the main main question in my the back of my mind uh, and that is the you know they're learning to get along not just with mother's supervision but that last week you described is that's when they learn to get along with everybody else correct correct and you can you know you can kind of see sometimes a dog that has been taken away from the other puppies too early they they, they can be and if they might be introduced to another dog right away so then they don't have that but they can be socially awkward if you will with other dogs yeah yeah well don't get me started we'll have to do another <laughs> podcast on that right. um uh, and before we go you did mention some uh, i'll call them diseases there are conditions or other things that we screen for whether it's hips eyes elbows uh anything else in that world that a that a puppy buyer ought to be cognizant of well, if I were getting a puppy in today's world, I would want to make sure that they were genetically tested, the full genetics uh, uh-huh. through paw prints or any of the genetic testing companies that do it for dogs. But the, the two other main things that come up with Labrador Retrievers is EIC, which is exercise-induced collapse, which is huge, yeah. and CNM. Now, CNM isn't near as uh, a big deal but it's totally debilitating to a dog and you'd have to put the dog down. EIC now is a really different, it's only come around in the last, I'll say 15 years, let's say the university of Minnesota uh, started seeing, or people around the country started seeing a lot of dogs hunting and are getting excited and then getting wobbly, like heat stroke type thing. Sure. And I've seen that. Yep. Yep. Get all wobbly and kind of dysfunctional and whatever. Well, then it was determined that, it, but it might not have been hot out, uh, or they might have been swimming and it happened, or whatever. Well, they determined and they did a testing, and the University of Minnesota came up with the testing procedure, if you will, for EIC, exercise induced collapse. And it's when the muscles um, deplete themselves of the necessary uh, things they need to operate. The dog's not hurting. It's not uh, in stress or anything. It's just the, the, the muscles start giving out because they don't have enough uh, energy, if you will. Yeah. And they'll get wobbly in the back end, and the dog will be down from anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes. And then it'll pop back up like nothing happened and everything's fine again. Wow. Uh, that's exercise-induced collapse. And that won't uh, generally doesn't harm the dog as far as them passing away. But it's, you know, it's hard to hunt a dog that you're going to take out and in 15, 20 minutes of hunting, it's going to go down and you've got to wait 15, 20 minutes. Then it gets up and then it gets excited and it goes down again. So wow. that's something we test for. And, and the genetics are that a dog can be clear, meaning that there's always two genes, right? So it can be clear. It can have one of the EIC genes, which means it's a carrier, mm-hmm. but it won't show the effects of EIC. It won't go down. It won't do it, but it's a carrier. It can pass that carrier status on. And then there's the second one, which is our third one, which is affected. That means both genes have the EIC gene uh, in the chromosome pair, wherever they're located. We won't get into that because I don't know mm. enough about that. <laughs> but but then if they have two, they're, they're affected and would definitely pass on to a dog the EIC gene where a, a dog that is a carrier can be bred but it only should be bred to a non-carrier clear dog because if both of them pass on the uh, EIC gene, then the, the puppy will be affected and will be going down and getting you know wobbly uh, whenever it gets excited, that kind of thing. So um, if you have a dog that's EIC uh, carrier, you can actually breed it, but it should always be bred to a dog that's EIC clear. Word to the wise, if you're buying or breeding, either way, and believe me, if you've never experienced that situation, you do not want to go through it. So just be extra careful with your genetic testing. That's Kent Shelton. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. Kent, 
Uh, we could go on and on and on, but what a great introduction to the whole puppifying uh, phenomenon that you live through all the time and we only see the fringes of periodically. Thanks so much for, for helping out in that regard. I'm going to cut you loose to go do more important stuff than talk to me. We've got a few more things to talk about here, so you all listeners stick around. Kent, thanks again for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. See you in October. Absolutely. Take care. Oh, boy. Um, love, love learning, and so do you. Of course, that's why we are here at the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you so much again, Kent, for all your help. And and by the way, everybody else who was so hospitable in the Huron, South Dakota booth at Pheasant Fest, great to see everybody. We got more coming up here in the Upland Nation glossary. We're already up to G with a couple E's uh, thrown in. Thank you, listeners. And a chance to do your mentor a big favor as well as a feel-good story from texas for all you bird dog lovers out there and if you weren't one you wouldn't be here so stick around we're brought to you in part by dr tim's natural performance dog food d-r-t-i-m-s dot com is where you learn more about omega-3 fatty acids yeah they're important they're critically important to your dog's peak performance and you know the best ones come from ocean fish, not plants. Look at your dog food ingredients and figure out if there are any ocean fish in those ingredients. That's where those critical fatty acids should come from, not plants, from fish. That's why Dr. Tim is so transparent about the origins, the sources, the amounts, and the types of ingredients you know, you can get 30% off your first order. They'll ship it right to your door. Use the code UplandNation at D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. And once you got your dog squared away, how about your shooting? Didn't go as well as you thought it would, did you? Well, now is the time to start working on it. And one place to do that, if you're in the West, is Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. Dave Fiedler and his crew of instructors have got you fitted out for better shooting. And part of that is gun fit, what method you use, and all the other factors. They will identify those and help you become a better shooter this off season. Learn more at midvalleyclays.com. Make it a stop on your clay Vacation. Yeah, they got spot for you with your RV. They're in um, central western Oregon, the town of Jervis near Salem, Oregon. They got any number of clay target games for you to practice on, take a lesson, skeet, trap, sporting clays, five stand. It's all there, all available. More information at midvalleyclays.com. Yes, the Upland Nation Glossary is available at findbirdhuntingspots.com. Just go there and search around, uh, probably under hunting tips. I think that's where I put it. But the glossary is is there for your use if you are just learning about bird dogs and bird hunting or if you just want to, uh, you know, uh, pick up something else for your own edification. It's all right there. Couldn't find any ease, but I've got some now thanks to some great listeners. How about e collar? Uh, and eng for english springer spaniel in that breed club ease thank you i'll put those in very soon but we're up to g here and g means green broke in some parts of the country green broke is the same thing as a started dog and it usually indicates some level of training in obedience and some elementary hunting skills showing a point on wild birds for example uh coming back when called holding still when you want it that sort of thing maybe even walking at heel that's a green broke dog or a started dog in some cases it's all available at the upland nation glossary at findbirdhuntingspots.com all right here's a story that just got to be told and you better hope that you got a game warden like this in your part of the country when you need it some 
Hunters uh, looking for quail on some ground in Texas when they shoot a few, send a pointer, young pointer off to retrieve one. The pointer never comes back. They can't find the dog. They search everywhere, can't find the dog. They call the Texas Park and Wildlife Division's Carlos Maldonado III. He shows up. They finally find that dog at the bottom of what they thought was an abandoned well. It turned out to be a underground grain silo, 50 feet down. That dog had landed, survived, and was up and looking for help. So Carlos goes back to the truck, gets a rope and a dog kennel. They toss a freshly harvested quail into the kennel, lower the kennel all the way to the bottom, fetch the pointer climbs in and they hoist her back up happy ending in texas way to go carlos and gosh i hope that dog understands what a big hole it looks like from now on thanks so much carlos for going above and beyond the call of duty there hey do one of your mentors a solid audio cardio our newest sponsor asks Who's your hero? H E A R dash O H. You can enter this sweepstakes via the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. Just go to the post that's pinned to the top. If someone's positively impacted your hunting life, then maybe they could use your help. Enter them to win a free 12 month subscription to this hearing app. Just an app on your phone. No appointment needed, just an app. Three nominees will get a free year of the app, which is physical therapy for their ears. Nominate them at the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. Thanks again to Kent Shelton from here on South Dakota for some insights into the whole puppy world and some hunting strategies as well. Thanks to all of you for listening and spreading the word. Thank you to our sponsors and those who left ratings at Apple Podcasts. Sure appreciate that. I'll leave you all with these words of wisdom from author Derek Bruce. He says, in order to keep a true perspective of one's importance, everyone should have a dog that will worship him and a cat that will ignore him. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks again for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Until we meet again right here, I'll see you at the range.